Okay, so yeah, I think we can start. Um, so welcome back to the uh, four methods for software engineering, and we're still looking at alloy. We looked at relations, and then um, we looked at different multiplicities for relations, and we also saw, well, the next thing we wanted to look at is uh, this uh, size operator or number of elements iterator, and this can be applied to any kind of relation, uh, no matter what arity the relation has. So there are these relations with arity one, those would be the ones uh, created from signatures. They're basically sets of elements, um, like list or nodes, those were signatures. And then there are, uh, for example, binary relations that have always two elements, like the link relation that goes from one node to another. Um, so we can also count the number of elements in these. And the way to count is this uh, hash operator. The hash operator lets us count how many elements we have in a set. So for example, here, if we extend our list signature with a field size, and uh, then we have a predicate that says the size is okay, or the size is basically uh, correctly specified, then uh, we would say list.size equals um, the number of elements in list.header dot uh, this reflexive transitive closure of link. So uh, if you remember what this list.header was, the list.header gives us the first element, this n0, and then uh, the reflexive transitive closure of link gives us um, basically the, well, each element with itself and also uh, the application or multiple applications of this, uh, 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 yeah, like concatenated uh, joins of this link relation so that we would also say, well, if we can go from N0 to N1 and from N1 to N2, we can go from N0 to N2. That this kind of closure uh, operator that we had here with the uh, reflexive transitive closure. Um, so it would basically give us the set of all the nodes that are inside the list reachable from the header. Um, so, and then we can count this and this would be exactly the size of the list. Now there's one issue. Um, here is the example. Um, so we have extended this. Uh, this was our list. Um, still had our header and then we had the new element size of type int. So um, there are a few tricky bits about integers in alloy. Uh, they are not the same integers as we had in SMT. So integers in alloy, um, because alloy is translated to an, a SAT solver, they can't be real integers because SAT solvers don't understand integers. So what happens here is that uh, these integers are um, bounded and they are expressed as basically bitwise uh, where each bit is a Boolean variable. And um, then they also have a problem with the sizes. So we could have integer overflows or underflows. Um, so we have to be a bit careful about that. And we can give the size of integers as a number of bits in the run command. So uh, here we have this general for three, and then we could say, uh, well, but three int. Then our integers would be represented with uh, three bits, and representing with three bits, that's basically uh, only going until, so we, we can have eight possible values, but because one bit is the sign, we can basically go from minus four up to three. So these integers wouldn't be very large. Uh, if we just use three bits. Um, okay, if we run this, we're going to see our uh, list and some node. And um, now that's the next issue. This is actually a bug in our uh, visualizer. So this is a, um, yeah, usually you could click show int and you would get the integers, uh, but it just crashes. Um, so that's not nice. Um, what what I'll do is I'll use the uh, desktop application of Alloy, and then uh, I'm going to show you how the integers work 
uh, sadly, because we, we're still trying to fix this. So once we fix this, it's also going to work on the web, but uh, if we, until we haven't fixed it, integers are not going to show on the web. So in the alloy analyzer, we now see here the integers. So here we see our integer. The list has size zero. It's correctly computed. Uh, let's look at the uh, next one, um, showing a new solution. Now the list has a header and then the size of the list is one. So yeah, this seems to work. Uh, let's go a bit further. So now uh, again, some simple sizes here. Um, looking at integers, ah, let's go back to the instance. So uh, Alloy can also show us a textual representation of the instance that it founds. And this is basically this, this kind of stuff. It looks a bit ugly, but uh, it, it's very, very helpful. It's basically this kind of stuff that we have been looking at the whole time. Uh, these are these kind of relations. So we see that here is the list relation, which is created from the list signature. So it has elements list zero. Um, then there's somewhere the node relation, which is node zero, node one. Um, and we also get the links. Links uh, goes from node zero to node one. So exactly the same kind of syntax here. And then we can see what our uh, integers are. They're basically going from, well, minus four to three, because we gave them only size uh, three. If we extend this, um, let's say to size four, and we execute it again, then uh, now our integers uh, can go from, well, minus eight to seven, because we added one more bit uh, in the representation. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, those twice open. So two int, uh, this is, would let us basically go from, uh, no, ah, I need to run again and open the instance again. Uh, yeah, two int, this would only let us count from basically minus two. I don't know how they order it. It's a bit uh, strange. Is it alphabetically ordered? Maybe it's alphabetically ordered, although, uh, it doesn't make much sense here, but yeah, uh, that's basically uh, this set. And then um, now uh, the question is, what if we say uh, that everything that uh, we had this uh, all nodes in list, right? Uh, so that we don't have these kind of dangling nodes, which would be a bit boring uh, because then we get so many instances. So how do we say that all the nodes are in this one list? We say list dot header dot link, uh, and then we say, ah, we could, we could say node equal. Um, so the, ah, you can't really see, uh, <laughs> the uh, set of nodes that we have is exactly all the nodes that we have linked in our list. Now let's see what this gives us. <clears throat> ah, and let's go back to visualization, right? Uh, <clears throat> so now we can have, uh, yeah, this list here, uh, no nodes yet. Now we have a node. Now we have uh, two nodes and the size of our list is minus two. Hmm. Didn't we require, uh, where is it? Uh, Come on. Mm, yeah, okay. Uh, we required that the size of the list equals uh, the number of elements in the list, right? The number of elements in the list are two. How come it gives us the size minus two? That's because we have an integer overflow. Um, we saw that the... Uh, possible integers that we could have, it can only count basically zero, one, and then if it tries to add an one to one, it ends up at, uh, well, minus two, it wraps around. So this is like in, uh, in most programming languages where you can have integer overflows or underflows, uh, but here our integers are usually much smaller than in most programming languages. Um, we can of course try to get larger integers, um, so for example, um, 
yeah, I don't know. What's in Java? An integer has 32 bit, right? Hmm. Mm, okay, uh, we can't even represent that. Uh, so let's say uh, that, and then suddenly everything gets really slow um, because it now tries to represent. So it, it's still trying to work. Uh, it's still working uh, because it now tries to represent those integers that it has, which are not many, right? It's only this this kind of one. Uh, this one integer here now tries to encode it in set variables. So alloy is really bad at integers, at arithmetic. So if you want to do any kind of arithmetic, um, yeah, it ran out of memory. Uh, okay, uh, then don't don't do it with alloy. If you want to do arithmetic, do it with uh, SMT, for example. If you want to do structures, yes, that's something with alloy. Uh, wow, it, I already gave it sixteen gigabytes, um, and that's the maximum I can give it. Okay, yeah, so just. Uh, Yeah, uh, 30 might be a bit too much. So, well, we, we, we know how high we have to count, right? We have to count maximum to three. Um, and then there's no other arithmetic. So if you want to count to three, then actually uh, three bits are enough because then we can count up to, well, exactly up to three. Um, so now if we run it, uh, we should get more meaningful instances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Size two now. Size three now, and that's it. Uh, that those were all the possible lists we could have if we want uh, all of them to be in there. Okay. So yeah, that that much about integers, <laughs> and and counting the size. Uh, there's also this uh, option, and I think this was turned on by default. Maybe. Uh, you can let it prevent overflows. So there's this uh, prevent overflows. And now let's see what happens if we want, uh, if we reduce it again so that we might have an overflow. So we find again our size of list zero, our list of size one, and that's it. No more find, no more matching assignments because now overflows are prevented. But this basically means whenever an overflow would be necessary, there's no instance. It, it says there's no instance I can compute. So now uh, we get a different kind of behavior that is related to overflows, um, but it just rejects instances where overflows would happen. And that's probably not what we want, right? Uh, so whenever you use alloy integers, um, yeah, make sure you calculate what is the maximum that you might have to uh, count and then uh, you should be fine after setting this large enough. I mean, we can probably also go to five, uh, stuff like that should be fine. Yeah. It just gets uh, exponentially more complex if we increase the number of bits in the integer. Okay. Um, yeah. That's about uh, sizes. And um, then, of course, we can compare integers so we can have also some kind of yeah, comparison operators, these normal uh, greater than, uh, greater equal. So they, they just work uh, the way we are, uh, we, we know them. Um, and then there's also these kind of negation operators. Uh, they just reverse uh, it. But I think that's really unintuitive uh, to say not less or equal. You could just say greater than, right? Uh, which which is much more readable. Okay. Um, yeah, and then for example, we could ask for um, a if we extend a node with integers, um, and then we say that we want some kind of order. We could say that uh, for all nodes n one and n two that we pick, um, we want if there is a link in the node. Ah, that doesn't make sense. It must be n one or n two, um, right? <laughs> We can't pick uh, n1 and uh, n2, and then, uh, uh, yeah, this code doesn't make sense. Uh, so let's fix it. Uh, we actually only need to pick one element. Um, we have this cyclic ordered. Uh, yeah, we, okay, I, I fixed it already in the code. 
uh, but I didn't fix it on the slide. So for all nodes, if the node has a link, this implies that uh, the element of the current node is less than the element of the node we are linking to. So this basically allows us to say that the list is uh, well sorted because uh, yeah, because of the uh, integers that we are attaching to the nodes. <clears throat> uh, and again, we can try to run this and we will see uh, that we don't see integers. So let me just copy this also uh, back to the desktop version. Uh, and then I kind of also like this uh, that we have all nodes in the list and then we can have a look. So now we have a list with a node and the node has element six. Now um, there is another one with, uh, well, seven, uh, well, six and seven. So the next node really has an element that is greater than the previous node. Um, yeah, well, five and seven, of course, also works. And now we have many different solutions because the integers that are attached to the nodes, they could always be different atoms. So yeah, you also get a lot more possible solutions for some ordered list. Okay, uh, yeah, so that's about uh, ordering. I, I should really fix those slides. Um, ah, no, okay, all gone. Uh, so there were some... Mm. Yeah, let me just... Uh, fix the slides right away and then I'll upload them later. Um, yeah, that should be fine. Okay. Um, is anybody taking notes on the slides directly? Right now? Well, not right now, but yeah, I'm sorry. The I'll update the PDF. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so if we, now that we learned a little bit about sizes uh, and, and quantification and multiplicities, uh, we can go back to our example. So what, what did we see here? We saw this uh, expression of some node in the list has an empty link relation. So now we have this uh, quantification. Sum means there exists a node n from this set where uh, there is no link to any other node. So somewhere in the list, we must have a node uh, that doesn't link further. And the only way to do that is to basically have no cycles. Um, okay. So this was this kind of existentially quantified formula with the sum. We have always a quantifier. This could be sum, this could be all. Then we have one or more variables that we introduce that we want to quantify over. So this is our n. And this n we can use in the subformula, of course. That's what we use here. We, we use this element that we quantified over in the subformula. And then we have the domain, where do we pick this element from? Uh, we could also pick multiple elements from the same domain, uh, but then it could be that they are actually, uh, yeah, the same node. Um, okay, so this would be the general structure of the quantification. Uh, this was our domain. And then uh, what we used here, did we did we discuss this closure? This uh, that it's the reflexive transitive closure. Uh, yeah, I think we already computed it right. But there's basically here uh, another slide just on this. Um, so basically, it's the the star means it's the uh, transitive closure with the identity on top. So the identity always takes uh, each element and maps it to itself. So the identity relation. Uh, is, yeah, I, I think I have it. Oh, we can even, we can even look at it. So let's, let's say the identity relation for this thing, uh, there's somewhere the evaluator. So if we ask for the identity relation, then we're going to see that this is the identity relation. Uh, well, 
zero is identical to zero and all this stuff. So the showing the integers sometimes is a bit uh, annoying because there's lots of them. Uh, but then we see list zero is identical to list zero. Note zero is identical to note zero. And it only has the identity stuff, basically. Um, and then, um, where, yeah. where did the slides go? Here. So we're basically unioning this with the uh, transitive closure. And the transitive closure is basically this expansion. We take the relation itself and union it with the relation joined with itself and union it with the relation joined with itself. Um, union and alloy would be simply the plus operator. Um, and so what relation do we have here that we can play with? Uh, well, we have our relation link. Uh, so we can also look at link. Link says, um, it's basically node one to node zero. That's a really boring relation because it's, what's the transitive, uh, or what's the reflexive closure of this? It would be, uh, you can't really see. So here, uh, this is the, let's maybe get another one. So this, this is a really boring relation here because if we basically do link dot link, it's already an empty set, right? Because there's nothing on the left that also matches uh, on the right. So uh, let's see if we can get a more interesting. Uh, we, we cannot do that here. Note, uh, the links are, Okay, we had uh, this other one, which was a bit more interesting, I think. So let's get a longer list. Okay, that's it. Um, now our evaluator. Uh, okay, so, and I have to put it back here. So this is now our link. Uh, this it, it still keeps the old stuff. Uh, so it just ignore everything above because that's from a completely different instance. So it doesn't apply anymore. Uh, now this is the link relation. Um, it links node one to node zero and node two to node one. Um, so now that's the relation itself. And if we do link dot link, if we join link with itself, then it basically uh, takes each pair uh, and tries to combine it with each pair on the right. So we basically take this, copy it here, and then we see, well, this one ends with a node zero. The first line here would start with a node one. So we can't join this, uh, nothing will happen. Um, the second one here, um, well, this one here, sorry, this one ends with a node one, and the first line starts with a node one, so we can join this. And the join of, Basically, the last line and the first line would be node two, uh, node zero. That would be the new pair that is created in the join. Um, are there any other pairs? So we would have to look, is there anything else where we have an element on the right that matches an element on the left? No, we don't have any other one. We only have it for this uh, node one. So this is the join if I join link with link. So um, yeah, I joined them on the, let's say the, the uh, right and left elements, and then what is left is n2, n0. Uh, now we said that the transitive closure is link union, and union in alloy is plus uh, link dot link. It shows like if, if there's an element common to other elements, then it shows it as like that. So basically means uh, this one is linked to node two and this one is linked to node two. Um, then we set the transitive closure goes further and also takes the three joins. So we, we also need to join it uh, link dot link dot link. Now that is empty. That is empty because, well, uh, the result of link dot link was basically this one up here, right? Uh, and we see that if we copy this thing next to it, uh, then this one only has node zero on the 
right. And this one would only have node zero, uh, no, sorry, node two on the left. And zero and two, they're not the same, so we can't join them. And now we have the empty one. And then if we join the empty one again with link, we will end up with, again, the empty one, right? So if you have no tuple into anything you join with the empty one, it's immediately empty. So uh, uh, yeah, this, this basically, I think the empty one is none. Yeah, so if we join none with link, it's empty. If we join none with uh, int, it doesn't like it uh, because uh, no, well, int is uh, maybe special. Let's try. Ah, because int is uh, not a relation. Well, uh, let, let's try uh, to join it with uh, note. No, doesn't like it. Um, type none, right hand side is. Oh, okay, doesn't like the types. How come it liked link as a type? Mm, I don't know. Um, okay, so uh, none doesn't join with every uh, with all the things, uh, only with maybe binary relations. I'm not sure. Okay, um, good. So, but basically, this means that now we can stop uh, trying. Um, and yeah, this this other thing uh, link dot link dot link. This was the empty set, so we're just ending up in a in a stable place. So uh, that's why it's called also the, the closure, because if we do this infinitely long, we know we don't have to, uh, but at some point it will kind of stabilize. And uh, that is the value that we want. So this is the thing we're looking for. That's the transitive closure. And now we said, well, the, this is the definition of the transitive closure. And then we, we said before uh, that the reflexive transitive closure is simply the union of the identity with uh, that thing, so we can just add uh, the identity also. Um, oh, then we have those integers. Okay. Um, and then it, uh, yeah. Actually, it should be. Uh, this identity is really not the right identity, I think. Uh, because now uh, it says here that uh, the reflexive transitive closure of link. Uh, did we get that? Ah, okay. So the reflexive transitive closure of link is uh, exactly the same as this identity thing. Uh, no, where was it? Here. So we can check this in the evaluator and it says that's true. Um, so the reflexive, well. So the uh, reflexive transitive closure apparently also contains uh, other elements that uh, are in the identity relation, but then also everything in link. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's the uh, reflexive and the reflexive transitive closure. Um, and if we wanted to yeah, try what this looks like for link, we, we basically just did this. Uh, we can, um, yeah, we had a very, very similar example, maybe not exactly the same atom names, uh, but then uh, we can just simply join these out. So it has link itself that's just copied down here. And then this new element, oh, that's, I think that's exactly the one we had, right? Um, this new element would be the one that joins on this uh, N1, so N0 to N2. That's the reflexive closure. Um, and then if we want to join this with N0, which was the list header, uh, that's basically list header dot this uh, reflexive closure, then that's uh, joined with N0. So we look at uh, where is N0 on the left side of any of those tuples? So we see this one has it. So N1 is part of the result. This tuple here doesn't have a compatible element here. So this thing is just deleted. Uh, here, this has a compatible element, again, N0. So N2 is also part of the result. So the result is N1, N2. Uh, 
yeah, that's how we would calculate those closures uh, in one and two. Um, yeah, then we had this reflexive transitive closure and uh, yeah, just, just includes the identity, otherwise it's just the same. Um, and then we saw already this iden is something that is predefined in Alloy. There's another thing that is uh, predefined in Alloy uh, that we tried. This is none, the empty set, but this has some, uh, yeah, apparently it's a bit picky about the type that we join it with, right? Because uh, it didn't let us join it with list, uh, but it lets, lets us join with uh, those relations. Uh, and then we have stuff like uh, unif. Unif is basically the set of all elements. So this is like, uh, yeah, whatever there is, it's, it's going to be um, all the atoms, they're going to be in unif. Um, <clears throat> yeah, not all, the, uh, not all the tuples, but just all the atoms, they'll be in the kind of universe unif. So if we wanted to uh, get our unif here, uh, then of course it has all these uh, annoying integers. And at some point it has the ones we're really interested in. Uh, it has the list, the node zero, node one, node two, right? That's our, um, yeah, universe. And I think that's also shown when we look at the textual variant. Yeah, so unif is also always shown in this, this textual variant. Um, yeah, and here are the interesting ones. Okay, um, then uh, here in our, well, singly linked list example, uh, we want the reflexive transitive closure. So we already computed the transitive closure of link, which was that. Um, and then if we here do this uh, reflexive transitive closure, uh, now without all these integer stuff, um, then it would be the union of this thing with this thing, right? Uh, simply adding all the elements together. And then if we do the um, list header dot and join it with this reflexive transitive closure, we will see, well, uh, basically we have to collect all the elements from both of these relations, right? Because if we do the union uh, before the join, then it's the same as um, joining each one and then doing the union. So uh, N0, well, compatible, compatible with this. So N0 will be part of our result. And yeah, that's it for the identity. Uh, then here, N0 again, part of our result, but because it's a set, uh, we just have one copy. Ah, no, sorry, we have to do this one here because this was already the union of those two. So when we look for results to pick up, we look for the identity here uh, and this thing or we just go through this list. But uh, let's just stick with what we started. So here N0 we get uh, from the identity and then from the transitive closure of the link, uh, we get N1 and N2. So this, this will be three elements. Uh, and that's exactly the elements that are in the list. Well, that's how we kind of constructed it. Okay, um, yeah, and then we simply state here this, uh, this sub-formula in our quantification, this would be the no n link. Um, and yeah, if we want to expand that, uh, what was link? Uh, link was, well, this, uh, all the links we have, and then we join it with the node n that was taken, uh, but now we had this uh, kind of, what kind of quantification did we have? we had uh, an existential quantification. So we said there exists some n uh, from this set. Now we know what this set is. This set is our n0, n1, n2. And now we have to check uh, that really there is an n such that uh, n.link is empty. Now, because it's an existential quantification, we will basically have to try it for each element in there, right? So um, we can try it for with n equals n0, n equals n1, n equals n2. Um, and again, the join, uh, here we see a matching pair, so that's definitely not empty, right? This is the set N1. Um, here we see a matching pair, so it's not empty, it's the set N2. Uh, here we see no matching pair, right? So this one is the empty one that we find. So yes, our list does end, and it ends in N2. Um, so there we have our satisfying uh, like expression inside the 
quantification. So we finally made the subformula true by finding a specific element for n uh, that is the one that has no uh, no further link. Okay. Um, for these quantifiers, there are a few. Um, the all and uh, some, they are basically the existential the, or the universal and existential ones. They are the regular ones that you know from math. Then there is the no, that's basically the uh, like the negation. Well, is it the negation of the existential one? Something like that. Uh, there is no, there does not exist any uh, where it holds. So, um, then you just have to make sure that it doesn't hold for any of the elements. And then you have loan, um, which means that it holds either for none of the elements or for at most one of the elements. Um, and then you have this one, which means it holds for exactly one of the elements, which is sometimes uh, also used in math when you want to say it, like a, the unique existential quantifier, there exists a unique value for which this holds, then that's the basically one. Um, okay, but I think the yeah the most common are really the all as the universal quantifier and the sum as the existential one, and they also behave uh, the way that we know the quantification from uh, SMB, uh, sorry SMT, from SMT solvers. That's the same. Uh, yeah, SMV will be the next chapter, but uh, yeah, SMT was the previous one. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, these are the the quantifiers. Um, and then, yeah, if we would do this on our list example here, uh, we say for all um, elements in the list, there is no link. What would we get? What kind of lists would we get? If we use the, so we had the uh, existential quantifier always for this kind of sub formula, right? Uh, what if we change it to the universal quantifier? So, um, I just put in the run command uh, this expression. What is it? Is it satisfiable? Do we get any solution? Yeah, we can get an empty list. Can we get more than the empty list? We can get a list with uh, one element because that still satisfies it that all the nodes in the list, so well, there's this this node, right? Um, it has an empty link, yes. Uh, can we get a list with two elements? No, because then, um, well, one of them would have the uh, needed a link uh, because we specified here that, uh, well, no dangling nodes, right? Uh, so. Um, we can't get with two elements. Now, what about the next one? If there is sum, that's exactly the one uh, we used before. This just means there are no cycles, right? Uh, and uh, the nice thing is if you have a uh, quantification over n, uh, in, in many cases, uh, this n is identified in your instance. So it actually says which one did it pick as the n. Uh, well, and of course it has to pick the last one because that's the one with no link, right? Uh, in, in the list has to end somewhere. Uh, yeah, and then it always has to pick the last one. Um, <clears throat> what about this one? If we say uh, there does not exist any uh, node in our list such that it doesn't have a link. Um, so this means, basically, if, if you negate it, it means all elements in the list must have a link. Um, is that possible? What would be an example? Would the empty list still be an example? Yes, because uh, for the empty list, there wouldn't be uh, any link, and then it should be an example. Uh, but this one is, of course, also an example, um, because here, there is no node which uh, doesn't have a link because if we pick this node, then of course it has a link. It has a link to itself. So now this is uh, actually forcing cycles in the list. Um, sorry? 
Ah, no, well, no, this, this was always the fact about the cycles. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the empty list is still possible, but all the other lists, they basically need uh, some cycles. No. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then loan. This uh, would, what would this give? So this means there's either zero that do not have a link or uh, there are, uh, there is exactly one that doesn't have a link. Um, this means what, what kind of lists can we have? This one is one where we have um, one, which, sorry, uh, yeah, loan. So we, we have one which doesn't have a link. That's fine. Um, and then it's the one where we don't have one which doesn't have a link. <laughs> Yeah, and then here again. Uh, so that's basically getting us back uh, our uh, lists, but they still allow um, cycles because there could still be one node which has, um, well, there could be one node which ends the cycle, but then uh, it could be also that all nodes have some links back. So yeah, it allows the cycles back. So this one is not very meaningful. And then this uh, exactly one, uh, th what does this give us? It says exactly one of them has no link. Uh, this then is the same as uh, here we had, oh yeah. I think that's the same as the sum because um, we also require that all the nodes are in the list. So this means we can, Anyways, even with the sum, you can't have two nodes which don't have a link. Uh, so that's why uh, the one, the instances that we get here are the same as the sum, but that's not in general. That's just because of these restrictions of our list structure that we say, well, it can have at most, uh, sorry, it can have at most one node that is linked to and all the nodes must be uh, inside the list. Okay, um, so then let's use our quantification and uh, revisit our uh, this drinkers paradoxon with the pub when uh, like uh, there is someone in the pub such that if they are drunk then everybody's drunk right so um, what is a good way to uh, express this now in alloy um, we have a few things where we have quantification. We know how to do this, right? This is existential quantification. So uh, this would be sum, yeah. Uh, then we have here universal quantification. This would be the for all or all, yeah. <clears throat> um, and then we need, uh, well, some set that we talk about. So this uh, these elements X, they need to come from somewhere. They need to come from some signature. So we can have a signature guest. And then um, now we, we might have different ways to represent this uh, predicate drunk. Um, but one, let's say very simple way is to say, well, there is a subset signature of guest. Those are the ones that are drunk. Um, now we can have a predicate drinkers and then we run this predicate. So uh, we could, yeah, do some experiments here. So yeah, we have one guest and the guest is drunk. Okay, uh, but we didn't specify anything yet, right? So uh, we might have two guests, one of them is drunk. Um, we might have no guests. Okay, so um, we can of course force some of these. We could say uh, drunk equals guest, right? And then uh, all the instances we ever get, all the guests will be drunk. Uh, we could say also other stuff like uh, nobody's drunk or the set drunk is, is empty. Uh, then we can still have guests. Just none of them are drunk. Okay, so that's kind of the mechanism of this subset signature. Um, but what we really want to say is um, oh. well, let's Scroll there so we can have it side by side. Um, 
yeah, what we really want to say is this, this kind of quantification, uh, this one here. So how do we do this? We said for the existential, we do a sum, right? Sum. And the variable that we quantify is x. And then we need to set where this x comes from. Um, yeah, we should get the set from guest. Because if we get it from drunk, then it's clear that, of course, this guest is drunk, right? Um, so we quantify from the guest. There is someone in the pub. This will be just a general guest. We don't know whether they're drunk or not. We, we just say there's someone in the pub. So this would be some guest. Yeah. Then uh, we need the kind of the body of the predicate, the expression. Um, and this says X is drunk, right? So someone in the pub that if they are drunk, it implies something. So how do we specify that X is drunk? Yeah, we say X is in drunk. This implies Yeah, we, we of course say that all guests, right? So here it says uh, everyone, which means all guests. So this Y implicitly now goes over the set of guests. Um, okay. And then if we check this, uh, we will see whether we have a satisfying assignment, right? Um, so, Uh, what was the deal with the SMT solution? Did we figure out that it was satisfiable or not? Is this thing true? That uh, there's some guest, and if the guest is drunk, then all the guests are drunk. Yeah, yeah? why? Ah. ah, wait, wait, wait. We we're just asking whether it's satisfiable, right? So this means, is there a possible scenario in a pub where this could happen, right? Uh, and yeah, we, we would probably say uh, that's possible. Um, sorry? Yeah, but is it valid? Okay, so how do we check if it's valid? Uh, we negate it. So here we were just running a predicate, right? Um, if we want to check um, something more, if we want to check a whole formula, then we have to put the formula in these curly brackets, and then we can write any formula that we want. Uh, so an easy formula is, for example, oh, the negation. Um, so this thing is also satisfiable for the empty pub, but that's it. So we probably should say, uh, uh, well, do we want to accept this, that in the empty pub, uh, this thing is satisfiable and that's why the statement is not valid? That's a bit strange, right? So we probably want to avoid the empty pub. So uh, we should say, and some guest, right? So otherwise the scenario is not so interesting. And then we see, uh, yeah, there's no instance. So this means that in every pub whatsoever, uh, this drinker's paradoxon is true, right? Um, doesn't even have to be a pub, right? Uh, does it say here anywhere uh, pub? So, uh, right. Uh, uh, yeah, another bug is the icons are missing. Uh, we're aware of this, we're fixing this. So this, this should be some icons. Uh, in the search replace, you have the tool tips, but uh, this is replace all, yeah. Okay. And this is a close, good. Um, so let's see if this thing is also valid uh, in this classroom, right? Uh, not We're not in a pub, we're in a classroom. Um, so, well, uh, for, well, three, but exactly how many students for student? 
right? Uh, and then we, of course, we don't need uh, this one. Okay, so let's see. This thing is uh, done. So if there is some student here. If the student is drunk, then everybody here is drunk. Um, let's look at some examples, right? Uh, very good example. So uh, which one of you wants to be student zero? Let's just number student zero, one, two, three, right? None of the students is drunk. So how come we still make this thing two? Um, it says which student it picked. Student three, so it picked you. Uh, and then it says if you are drunk and you're not drunk, right? Uh, so this one, uh, well, student three in drunk is false. False implies doesn't matter what, right? This can, could be true or could be false. So this means just because it picked somebody who is not drunk, we can conclude anything. So this thing is valid. This 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 uh, this uh, right side here is just uh, yeah valid automatically by picking somebody who's not drunk. Um, so now we can look at uh, some more instances. So even if some of you are drunk, uh, all three of you are drunk now. Uh, then, and, and he's still not drunk, but uh, it will still pick him and say, well, this guy is not drunk, so false implies anything, right? False implies false, that's fine, right? So it, it checks all students, well, you three are drunk, you're not drunk, right? Uh, so uh, all students are false, right? Uh, but still, false implies false. So yeah, it's just the way that this is written is not really intuitive uh, for, let's say, the general natural language. Um, we formulated it as there is someone in the pub such that if they are drunk, everyone is drunk. So uh, it would be maybe in a, in a different, more mathematical way you could formulate it. Uh, <clears throat> you can pick a person and, well, evaluate whether they are drunk, and this would imply that uh, other people are drunk as well. And this evaluation could be false, right? Here we are kind of thinking that this evaluation uh, of that person drunk will be true. That's what we are kind of assuming as a human. If you say you pick someone and they're drunk, but that's not how it works. Uh, we pick someone and check if they're drunk. So that's why this drinker's paradoxon actually, uh, yeah is uh, valid. So it's, it's a tautology. No matter what model you have, uh, no matter what classroom, no matter what pub, uh, this thing is true. Um, of course, if everybody would be drunk, then this thing is true. And then this thing also must be true, right? Uh, so then, of course, it also works, uh, no matter what x you pick. But as long as one of the people, one of the things you pick is not drunk, uh, then you can make this left side false, and that's it. You made the whole thing true. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the the solution here that we just developed. Um, and now let's look at some tricky expressions in alloy. They are, um, well, you could say they're kind of like side effects, or, or but in a declarative language, you don't really expect side effects, right? Uh, so let's let's look at some examples. Um, here we have this. Uh, well, it, it basically lists the, the problem down here. So we have this this model of our linked list, and uh, we just remove this no list header or uh, from the expression, and we left this sum. Uh, expression here. So how come we no longer get the empty list as a solution? So all the everything we would get uh, would have at least one node. Yeah, I think we mentioned this uh, before. Why? Ah. Mm, 
yeah, here we we say there is some element uh, in this links, um, well, transitive uh, reflexive transitive closure of link such there is no uh, x length. So link. So we need at least uh, some node to exist. Yes. So uh, yeah, we mentioned this last time, right? Uh, that's why we added the or two sessions ago, something we mentioned this already. Yes. So uh, this is why we can't get the empty list because we have this, uh, there is uh, at least one. Um, so we kind of have it over constrained. If this thing would have been empty, then the formula would have been false. So uh, this existence formula would have been false. So that's why we need one. Um, then what about this one here? We have this acyclic predicate. There is no uh, list dot header, so we put back this constraint, or and then we we basically just simplify the. So we put back this constraint uh, that we can have empty lists, or uh, and then we kind of try to simplify this one. We uh, simply say um, there is some node such that uh, this node doesn't have a link. Right, so uh, instead of saying there is a node in the list, we just say there is a node. Um, so now, why do we have a cycle when our predicate is called a cyclic? Yeah, now which one is the node that doesn't have a further link? It's not n0, right? Uh, it's simply n1. So um, here, we don't have enough constraints. Um, if we would have, so here, well, there are two things which we don't have enough. So one thing that we don't have enough is maybe node is too general because we want exactly only the nodes in the list. So we can say only the nodes in the list by replacing node with this uh, list dot header dot uh, reflex transitive closure of links. Okay. Um, or we simply say that all the nodes are in this one list. This would also be fine. So uh, this is an alternative uh, that we could have. I think we probably have this this uh, somewhere. Uh, so here now we get something like that. Ah, that's actually a good example. <laughs> yeah, that's a bad example. Okay. Uh, we can add more effects. We could say node equal uh list dot header I think uh, so everything that's in the list uh, is the set notes and then it would be fine we wouldn't get uh it can't pick any node uh and give it no link that is outside the list because now there are no longer nodes outside the list so uh Ah, okay, and we said uh, node is exactly two. That's why we have only this one single instance. Yeah. So there are different ways to kind of make this under constraint thing again constrained enough. One thing uh, where we could do is the the solution that we always had, where we say, well, we only pick nodes from list dot header dot uh, well transitive reflex closure of link, or we can simply say, well. All the nodes that exist, they are in the list anyways. Um, and that's equally uh, good to make sure that we now have no cycles anymore. OK, then this one here um, fails to generate this list. Why does it fail to generate this list? We changed uh, the transitive, uh, the reflexive transitive closure only to the transitive closure. So we don't have the union with identity in disclosure. Um, what would be the uh, transitive closure of the link relation here? What's the how many elements are in the link relation? Zero. Yes, exactly. The link relation is empty. Um, so how many elements are in something that I join with the empty link relation. That's also empty, right? Uh, so I can't pick um, an element. Um, and that's why 
in here, in this example, I couldn't pick an element, um, but I also can't make this one true because header is not empty, right? So this means this here would not satisfy that constraint, so we would never generate this example. Now, if we use instead the union with identity, then how many elements are in the link relation? Uh, well, tons, because all these identity elements, but it also has um, the n0, n0, right? Um, so we, we can say there is uh, some, and, and this was exactly our header node, right? So we join the header node n0 with our uh, identity n0 to n0, and this leaves us n0. And I can pick n0, and I can say n0 has no link. So with the reflexive transitive closure, that's fine, but with only the transitive closure, that's not uh, sufficient. So uh, yeah, the transitive closure would simply exclude the header here, um, but we want it to be considered as a node in the list. Um, yeah. So that's what we just said. If we have this, then the header, uh, then the elements uh, that we collect are n0. And if we only have the transitive uh, closure, then it's the empty set. Yeah. OK. Um, then we have some operations. We already saw this plus as the union. Uh, now that's a bit tricky here, this ampersand sign is not the end, like it was in Limbool. Uh, it is the intersection. So because we're working on sets, so the end is uh, like the logical conjunction is you really have to specify and or the double ampersand, I think. So if you put two of these, then it's the logical end. If you put one, it's the intersection. So that can lead to some syntax errors. Uh, well, minus, that's then uh, the difference. So I think just, uh, is it the removing? Maybe it's the removing. Uh, then in is the subset. We already used this. We said x in drunk, for example, uh, equals, yeah, that's equality and inequality. Okay. Um, and then to say here that a node is not in uh, the links, you, you could simply put the negation in front of the in, or you simply put the negation outside the whole formula, which is, yeah, maybe, well, I don't know, a matter of taste, uh, whether you want the negation right in front of the operator uh, or just outside the formula. Um, and then there are a few more advanced things. So we saw this kind of arrow, that's the cross product. Um, that's a really, well, a bit tricky one. Um, so let's see, and we need to go to maybe the evaluator here. Did we have an interesting instance here? Um, so let's say our listing is only one element, right? If we say uh, list, list, it's going to... <laughs> List list is going to evaluate to the cross product between the two sets uh, list. So it's going to create tuples um, where each element from the first set is combined with each element from the second set. Uh, so for list, there was only one element. So it just gives us this one tuple, right? Uh, this one pair. Uh, node has three elements. So if we say node, Note, um, what are we going to get? We are also going to get a set of pairs. So it's again, some binary relation. Uh, how many elements are we expecting? It's the cross product. So we would expect nine elements. Yeah, those are the nine elements. Um, now let's look at the, let's put some parentheses, uh, just to do the intersection. So if I intersect the, this with Iden, the identity relation. Um, how many elements am I going to be left with? Sorry? So the identity relation has stuff like 
integers to integers, right? This is this won't have any match in this one. So the intersection uh, for everything of integer and node stuff is going to be empty. But there are also some node tuples in the identity relation, uh, and that's those tuples are in the identity relation. So if I do the intersection between the identity with uh, some other cross product, then I'm going to get uh, the ones that are basically a subset of the identity relation, uh, which also was in the in the cross product. Um, yeah, that's the cross product. Mm, yep. Then transpose. This is I can flip uh, a relation around. This is. Do we have an example for this? Uh, yeah. So uh, I can I can basically take each tuple and reverse it by doing this uh, transpose. So instead of going from n0 to n1, if I do this uh, tilt thing, uh, I'm going from n1 to n0, and I'm going from n2 to n1. So it's simply taking each tuple and reversing it. <clears throat> so if I um, want a node, uh, let's say n0, and I look at the reverse link, uh, it's going to be empty. But if I look at, let's say, n1, and I look at the reverse link, it's going to give me n0, because that's basically the element I can read backwards. So sometimes I have to, instead of navigating forward, I want to navigate backward. And then what I can do is I can reverse the relation. Um, yeah. And then, of course, there's uh, this is not all the yeah, the relational join we, we had used a lot. These closures we also have used a lot. Um, and then we had used some predicates so far, right? But we never had used predicates with um, parameters. So uh, the predicates that we used were, for example, um, the acyclic predicate. But this never needed any parameters because we just wanted to say, uh, well, the one list that we have is acyclic. Um, we could define some uh, predicates and we can give them parameters so then they can still access everything in the whole alloy module, but they also have access to the uh, parameters that they were called with. Um, yeah, and then you introduce names again for the parameters. So if you want to use this predicate, then you have to give them either concrete values for the names. So let's do the cyclic one. Maybe, uh, where's the, here, this thing. Okay. Um, let's use the one that worked. Uh, and now, um, let's say we have multiple lists. And we want to, uh, give a list here as a parameter. So let's call this list L. Uh, and then instead of saying list.header, we say L.header. And then of course we have to use the same L. So now we are writing, um, uh, and this that's not making sense in this predicate. Uh, this should be effect. So now our uh, a cyclic predicate takes a list and states that this list is a cyclic. So if we uh, would simply run, let's say, an empty command uh, and let's run it for how many nodes do we want? Ah, let's let's just remove this thing. Uh, let's run it for the default. So now we have um, two lists and they don't have cycles. Okay. Okay, now we have two lists and both have cycles. Good. Um, so yeah, now of course we didn't use the cyclic predicate. Uh, we could use it in quantification. So for example, we could say there's exactly one, well, let's call it a list t in the set of lists such that mm, we have quick completion yeah l is a cyclic uh, sorry lst lst is a cyclic 
Ah, uh, there was a problem. Ah, okay. Mm. So if you call it, if you call the predicate, you have to use the square brackets uh, for calling the predicate. Um, okay, so now we say there is one list which is a cyclic, uh, and it's probably this one, which is doesn't have a cycle. Um, and the other one, well, does have a cycle. Okay, we could also say all lists are acyclic. Now what do we get? Yeah, now uh, none of the lists can have uh, cycles again. They can still share nodes, but that's uh, a different story, right? Um, yeah. So this is how we can use uh, parameters for predicates. Um, and then uh, we also saw that we use facts sometimes. Facts basically say something that is always true. So uh, here, this kind of connectedness or all nodes in the list, that's basically this fact that we have always been using to state uh, that well, all the nodes are the nodes that we can reach from that one list. Uh, no matter, well, we didn't really say that it's one list, right? Uh, could be, but it simply says that all the nodes are in uh, a list. There's no node which is not inside the list. Um, yeah, then other things that we might want to uh, define are functions. So they are different from predicates because they don't return a Boolean value, they return some set. So for example, I might want a, uh, yeah, what's the easiest function here? Well, this parent function uh, of a node. And I say the parent of a node, I basically go backwards in the set of links. And this is how I evaluate the function. And then I can call this function parent on any node. So um, I could, for example, call it here for is header, which is a predicate. This could check that there is no parent of that node. So the predicate invokes the function. Um, and then we reference this predicate uh, somewhere here in the well-formed list predicates, which is then used in the run command. So uh, yeah, we can similarly to predicates, we can define functions. And simply the expression that is in the function needs to evaluate to some value instead of uh, just true or false. Then we have a function. OK, and uh, finally, one thing we used um, usually the run commands, uh, but there is some syntactic sugar um, to have assertions. And assertions will be uh, something like our, uh, well, in our drinkers example, um, we could have used assertions. Do we still have it? Uh, here. Um, so here we get examples, right? Uh, but instead of having a uh, predicate, we can have an assert, which is also some, like a predicate, also some kind of Boolean value. And then we can check this assert. So uh, instead of running a predicate, we could check an assert. And then the behavior, so yeah. Mm. Yeah, so we have to, uh, for I think for run commands, we can put these things in uh, curly brackets and have expressions. For check commands, we need to have uh, exactly one assert. So uh, that's why we can check the assert drinkers. Um, and now it actually tries to find any counterexample. So it does this negation and run command automatically for us. So we don't have to do this negation manually and then check that there is uh, no, um, that it's unsat. Uh, we can simply make the predicate and assert and use a check instead. And this checks the um, validity of that. Um, uh, what's the output here? It says no counterexamples. So yeah, I didn't find any instance that violates it. Um, and then it says maybe valid. Um, why only maybe?
In the scope, yes, because we have a limited scope. <coughs> um, we, get, we can go maximum for four elements and exactly four students, of course. Um, there are probably some uh, things that might work for, that might be valid for three. Um, ah, well, now it's, uh, now it's found a counterexample because it's where we don't have any students, right? Uh, so, uh, okay, <clears throat> we can add the fact that there is at least one student and then this uh, works again. Um, okay, and then of course it could be that, I don't know, for scope eight, uh, there's finally a counterexample that is large enough to demonstrate uh, that it's not valid anymore. Um, yeah, but that's why uh, Alloy always says maybe valid because it can't know for sure uh, because it only has this bounded limited scope. Okay, um, yeah, then I think that's really just a quick um, overview of some of the alloy applications. So some, let's say, very early ones were concerned about modeling systems in alloys. So for example, in 2007, um, some people, they looked at more mathematical concepts of game strategies. And there are, I don't know if you've studied games, there are all kinds of games, uh, like these Vicre auctions, and then there are variants of auctions. Um, and they have these auctions, they basically need some properties, whether there are uh, some like uh, loopholes in the auction. So is there a way that uh, people can uh, together maybe cheat the system and win the auction when they shouldn't or uh, something like that. And what they did is they formalized some of these properties um, and then they were able to prove them or show them with the help of their alloy formalization. So for example, they were able to check that the highest bidder always wins, which is a good property for an auction. Uh, but uh, if you have a more complex model of auctions, then probably it makes sense to um, formulate it and, and really check it that it's true. And then they also have this property called strategy proofness so that the protocol is immune to counter speculation and strategic bidding so that people cannot um, basically yeah, fool the auction system to raise the price to some value that it shouldn't have. Um, so I tried to extract the specification from the paper because I didn't find any GitHub. Uh, so yeah, this is actually, it's not a very large spec. Um, and it's written by, well, people who are, um, let's say mathematically inclined. So uh, maybe not the most readable. Uh, but yeah, you can you can look at the original paper if you're interested in. But basically, this is one of the examples uh, where they took a, a problem which is completely, um, let's say, more of a mathematical theoretical problem, and they analyzed it uh, using alloy. Then uh, there's another one. There is a very popular, um, well, a, a distributed hash table, um, and it's called court and there's a protocol of how this hash table actually, actually can distribute the data over multiple nodes. And what happens if nodes uh, break or get corrupted, then it can repair itself. And uh, this, this thing was uh, the, the original protocol of this distributed hash table. This was uh, well presented in uh, well 2001 at some uh, big conference. And then 10 years later, it won the like test of time award. So that's given for publications uh, that had the most impact over the last 10 years. So they, they kind of won this prize. Um, and then another researcher, this uh, Pamela Zaif, she looked at formulating the properties that were claimed in this paper. So there are some properties in there uh, that, the property, that the protocol can repair all disruptions in the structure eventually. So after some, uh, I don't know, after some time, we don't know exactly how long it takes, but it can eventually repair. Um, and she found out based on the specification and based on implementations that she analyzed using Alloy, she found out that actually no published version of this uh, implementation of the court protocol is correct. They all had flaws. And that's what she showed with uh, some Alloy um, formalization. 
And then she presented some improved variant of the protocol. So this is uh, a bit larger case study. So you will see that this, uh, yeah, this alloy spec, well, it has quite a few lines. Well, I don't know, 261, maybe that's not a lot, but uh, it, it would take a lot of time to, let's say, read and write this stuff. And it has a lot of uh, checks and run commands that it checks. So people, like they, they use it to model and, and analyze substantial systems. So she did basically one year after those guys got their award. <laughs> uh, yeah. And she showed, and, and this was, um, yeah, well, uh, some distributed hash table protocol, but there are others, uh, for example, this open authentication framework, probably when whenever you see this kind of button, like log in with Google, log in with Facebook, then it's using this uh, open ID or open authentication framework. And um, parts of it, people have formalized in Alloy. So this framework is very complex. So you have to come up with, let's say, some abstraction of the framework that you can formalize in Alloy. Um, and yeah, they, they implemented some uh, variant or some, some abstraction of it and analyzed it. And uh, they didn't find any new bugs, but they basically confirmed some existing security issues. So by using the Alloy analyzer, they were pointed automatically by Alloy to this uh, security issue that people had previously discovered, but now it was basically automated. Um, and following this work, so this was also more than 10 years ago, uh, now there has been a lot more work where people have integrated Alloy into uh, security modeling and checking so that you can more easily create these specifications for internet protocols. So in, in recent years, people have basically continued with this, but not only manually, but also automatically. So you get some kind of um, different specification of your uh, security property and you automatically translate it to Alloy, uh, which would be a nice uh, uh, next homework, right? Uh, because you have to automate stuff. No, but we already have uh, yeah some something in mind. Okay. Um, yeah, so ba basically uh, this would be analyzing some systems with the help of Alloy and, and getting new insights. But then there's kind of a second branch uh, in this uh, work of Alloy. So the people have realized that Alloy is a nice and powerful specification language, but specification languages also have their problems. So another branch of work basically takes Alloy as an example of a specification language and then sees how can we improve specification languages in general. Um, so one thing is the, uh, let's say just the expressiveness. You always, well, are suffering from uh, not having enough expressiveness. You want to maybe specify something that's not there. Um, and one such example is some higher order logic quantifications. So maybe you want to quantify over subsets of a signature. Um, and that's, not so easy. So we had a subset of a signature. We had like this example of the uh, drunk guests in the pub. But if you want to quantify over these subsets, saying that uh, there is no subset such that people are drunk, or for all subsets such that people are drunk, uh, this is not inside uh, the expressive power of alloy because alloy is first order um, logic and this would be higher order logic. So if you quantify over the um, the, the domains um, in the first order logic, then you automatically get higher order logic. Another example is quantifying over relations. So you could uh, <clears throat> maybe want to say that for all possible ways to uh, well connect the list, there's no way to do some specific thing. Um, there are some tricks where Alloy is able to do higher order quantifications in a very limited sense. So for example, if you want to say that, uh, well, uh, there exists a subset of guests such that if one is drunk, then all will be drunk, right? This, um, you, could quant you could express this with quantification and then um, you can use the solver basically to say, well, if it finds the solution, then we know that the quantification was successful and if it doesn't find, then it was unsuccessful. Um, but that only goes for very, very specific versions of higher order quantification. And what these guys did is they basically extended um, 
alloy to alloy star, uh, where they edit higher order quantification. So you can quantify over relations, you can quantify over signatures in all combinations, which were previously not possible. And uh, it is, yeah, not so simple. So it, it kind of uses some um, something called counterexample guided inductive synthesis. Um, what happens is they're trying to synthesize a solution. So it's no longer just finding a solution, it's kind of synthesizing a solution because you have to craft this solution. Um, you start by guessing maybe a possible relation in your quantification. Uh, then you check if you fix this relation, you no longer have higher order quantification because now you have a fixed set. Uh, you check, is this thing valid or not? Um, and you figure out it's not, then you kind of do the next step where you try to guess another one um, that follows some properties. So you're, you're trying, you're basically doing a trial and error. You rule out more and more uh, invalid solutions so that in the end, hopefully you covered all of them and you either find a valid solution or you can determine that there is no solution. Um, yeah, and, and this can take very long, can be very expensive. Um, and in general, I think the problem is again undecidable. Uh, so yeah, you have uh, to rely on some bounds again. So this was, let's say, a bit more recent, uh, four years ago. Um, and they also did it on Alloy, but they say that it should work on other languages as well. So this this kind of uh, process to lift from first order logic to higher order logic uh, based on counterexample guided inductive synthesis. Although they showed it for Alloy, they said it might work on other languages as well. So yeah, maybe the next s &T solvers will, will have it. <laughs> um, then another one um, would be testing of specifications. So the question is, why would you test the specification when you already specify what you want, right? Sometimes you make mistakes in your specification um, and you might end up with uh, a specification that you think is correct, but you are not sure. So that's why you could write test cases. And then uh, there was a work that basically developed textual declarations and then people didn't really like it because writing tests like instances as like uh, this instance should be there or this instance shouldn't be there uh, as text might be a bit difficult. So that's why here this work, for example, they introduced, uh, ah, this was this year, they introduced some graphical test cases for alloy modules. So um, that's another kind of extension that is more like uh, an extension on top of alloy. And the last one, um, that is repair of faulty alloy models. So now you know, well, either you know that you have a uh, fault in your alloy model, either by testing or just because you have some, uh, let's say, check that you think this check should be valid, but it's not, right? Then how do you fix it? Um, and there are some people who worked on automatically repairing this. So if you have a predicate and your predicate doesn't return any result, then you can ask it to repair the specification. And the way they repair the specification is they try to mutate some of the operators in your spec uh, until they find uh, a spec that now satisfies your predicates and assertions. So um, this will kind of repair your specification based on uh, what you hopefully wanted but it could be a completely different repair, right? Um, so that's always that's always tricky. Um, so this all this 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 work on repairing specifications is uh, still quite quite early. Um, but people are working on this because sometimes you have a bug in your specification and you just can't figure out why. So uh, yeah, that's another kind of uh, application that uh, goes on uh, right now. Uh, well, yeah, two years ago. Um, Okay, yeah, and then I think that's it for today. So we uh, finished this chapter of uh, Alloy almost. Uh, next session we have the exercise, right? The interactive, uh, the the well automated one where you have to automate uh, some Alloy analysis. Uh, maybe a repair. Uh, <laughs> now that's maybe something for the project in the end, right? Because that's that's a bit more complicated. So yeah, okay. Great, yeah, so see you on Friday. <laughs>
for the project that's also 